first day slide. First, first day slides, and this is this one, yeah. One, uh, because then it goes on and on. So, <laughs> time I should uh, show a few more slides. <laughs> like this one? <laughs> I don't want to ruin, spoil your talk, so. <laughs> Start being a bit. Uh, yeah, 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 it's. Uh... <laughs> it's time and and we are on a soft schedule. Uh, yesterday was a little hard. Yeah, the, the colloquium was, was uh, at the end. tougher day. Okay. Okay, so uh, we are, I think, ready for the fourth lecture by Laurent. Okay, thanks a lot. So today we will um, unravel the strict entropy structure for the Boltzmann and Landau equations. So we actually saw the entropy structure uh, in the last lecture, at the end of the last lecture, and we sort of wrote down, or wrote up, actually, the entropy production, or the entropy dissipation, if you prefer, of the Boltzmann equation. It is given by the formula that you have uh, here in front of you. So. If you remember all what we say during the first lecture about uh, what is a strict entropy structure, what we should now check is whether when the entropy dissipation is equal to zero, we recover that F is actually a Maxwellian function of V. Okay, Maxwellian, if you remember, it means the exponential of a second degree polynomial. It's a specific type of Gaussian. Specifically, it's the Gaussian whose matrix that you have in front of the V square is uh, a constant times the identity. Okay, so we have to check this. Uh, traditionally, this is called uh, the second part of Boltzmann's H theorem. So I think it's proposition six, but I'm not sure about the number. So this is sometimes called the second part of Boltzmann. H theorem. And it states the following. If the function B, which is sometimes called the cross section, which appears in the equation at the end, just before the integration variables here, is strictly positive, then The only functions for which the entropy dissipation is equal to zero are the Maxwellians, which are defined, as I said, by m is a plus, sorry, m is the exponential of a plus b scalar v 
minus C V square, or V square over two, if you prefer. And actually, the same holds for the Landau equation. I will not write down immediately what is the entropy dissipation for the Landau equation. We saw that in last lecture, and I will show it to you again in a few moments. But let me say immediately that the same property holds for the Landau equation. And as we will see, this is really the central part of the strict entropy structure of Boltzmann and Landau uh, equation. So let me present the proof. So first, as this is called the uh, second part of Boltzmann's H theorem, you can guess that this was already proven by Boltzmann a long time ago. Uh, one has to be a little careful there because, of course, at the time of Boltzmann, people were not that interested in uh, smoothness conditions on the, on the function f. So the way it is written here, in principle, if you want to make a completely rigorous mathematical statement, you should say in which space f is living, and you should first check that the quantity d of f is defined where f is living in the space you are speaking of, okay? Uh, so, of course, Boltzmann was not that interested in, 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 in that kind of things, and so when you look at his own proof, you can see that basically he was assuming that f was, let's say, of class C2 or maybe C3, and to be more precise, it is logarithm of f, which has to be of class C2 or C3, uh, which means somehow that you suppose that f does not uh, touch zero, uh, typically, let's say. Uh, so I will try to give you a proof, which is based on the proof by Boltzmann first, and then the second proof. Uh, in the proof, uh, which is based on the proof by Boltzmann, as you will see, we will take a lot of derivatives, and I will comment at the end about whether one is entitled to really take that many derivatives or not, okay? So let me, let me uh, explain this proof. So you start from this quantity being equal to zero. Now, if you look at this quantity, this is the integral of something which is non-negative, because the logarithm is increasing, so it's like x minus y times log x minus log of y. And moreover, you have inside those two direct masses, which sort of fix the space on which the integral is really living. Okay? And so this exactly tells you that this is zero if and only if f of v prime times f of v prime star is equal to f of v times f of v star whenever the equalities which are written under the direct masses are true, okay? So, the first thing to observe is that this is equal to zero implies that actually d plus v star equals v prime plus v prime star plus uh, equality of the uh, kinetic energy uh, and of the momentum implies f of v, f of v star is equal to f of v prime, f of v prime star. And this is due to the fact that we suppose that the capital B is strictly positive here. Okay. So this is a sort of global statement which is a consequence of the entropy dissipation being equal to zero. Okay, I hope it's clear from the formula. And then, this exactly tells you that f of v times f of v star can be a function only of v plus v star and v square plus v star square. So, this tells you exactly that this can depend only on those two quantities. Or the same with divided by two, if you prefer. 
I hope it's all, it is also clear. Uh, if not, you can refer to the so-called factorization theorem in uh, set theory, which is something which is proven in like five lines, no more, which tells you exactly this. But I think it's something which can be understood directly, I think, it's, uh, if you think of it. So the first step consists in writing some kind of uh, functional equality or functional equation, if you, if you wish, which tells you that the tensor product of f at two different points depend only on those two variables here, which are momentum and energy. And you have to start from here, okay? Now, imagine that instead of having this, you have the same but only with the momentum. Then you could say that, well, in that case, basically T has to be F, because you, ta you take V star equal to zero, let's say, so up to a constant T is F, and you would end up with the traditional functional equality F of X times F of Y is equal to F of X plus Y. And you would deduce from this, by the usual methods, that F is actually an exponential of something, of lambda X, let's say, okay? So this, now what I will show now, is just a generalization of that, okay? It's more complicated because now you have those two terms here. Uh, so, uh, the idea here is actually to try to find a good uh, differential operator which transforms the function of v plus v star and v square plus v star square into zero without transforming too much the functions which do not depend on those quantities, okay? Now, once again, suppose now that T would depend only on this. This would correspond in terms, suppose that uh, V and V star are just one dimensional, this would correspond to looking at functions which are radially symmetric in the V, V star space. So the right operator to cancel it would be D over D theta in terms of polar coordinates, which you can write up to a multiplication as uh, let's say uh, uh, xy cross product uh, with uh, d over with a gradient. This is more or less the same as d over d theta, if you think of it. Well, anyway, <laughs> the point is to try to find the right one for, for those functions here. And actually, what happened is that the good idea is to look at something which looks like a little like d over d theta in terms of polar coordinates, but to take into account the fact that here this has to do with translation in the space of VV star, which has to do with Galilean invariance. So you try to get uh, an operator which looks a little like d over d theta, but which takes into account this translational invariance, and the good choice is actually this one. So you look at the operator, which is a cross product between V minus W and gradient V minus gradient of W. So let me first here change notations and take notations which are compatible with the Landau equations. So I will write W instead of V star from now on. What I say is that I use this operator here. So L is defined as V minus W cross product with gradient V minus gradient of W. And if you prefer to use coordinate, this is a matrix which has for coordinates VI minus WI d over dvj minus d over dwj minus vj minus wj d over dvi minus d over dwi. Okay? 
with what is written actually here. So let's check that this is indeed a good operator. So let's take Lij and apply it to functions which depend on this. The notation is not very uh, precise, but I think it's possible to really understand what happens. So first, I multiply vi minus wi by the derivative respect to vj of this quantity. Now, this quantity, it depends on v through this one and through this one. So you get here the derivative of t with respect to the first variable. This variable is vectorial, so let's call it gradient 1t. This is a derivative respect to the group of variables which are here, taken at the same point, plus 2 uh, v, uh, vj, sorry, the derivative of t with respect to the second group of variables, which consists of only one variable, and which I called, therefore, dt over d2. I hope that the notation is at least vaguely understandable. OK? So it's like this. And then I remove exactly the same quantity when I have exchanged g and a. OK? So vj minus wj times gradient 1t plus 2vi dt over d2. And you can see that uh, I do at this point. Uh, yes, 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 exactly. So this is the, uh, I did not, I, I, I wrote it, uh, uh, sorry. I, yes, 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 exactly. Uh, no, it's, it's written down. But let, let me write it more seriously. <laughs> okay, so here I used only the VJ, I did not use a WJ. Sorry for the. <laughs> so we get DT over, so I start with the D over DJ, so it's DT over d gradient 1 uh, 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 t plus 2 v j dt over d2 and then minus d over double wj so this is minus gradient 1 t minus 2 w wj dt over d2 and the same exchanging i and j, so like this. Sorry about this. Okay. And the gradient one uh, cancel at this level. And then the other part also cancels because, as you can see, you get vi minus wi times, I mean, uh, uh, he has scalar product times vj minus wj and exactly the same um, in the line below, okay? Well, so this is a good operator for canceling functions which depend on that. Then you have to use it on the left-hand side of the equation to see what appears at this level, okay? So when you do this computation, so if I compute now Lij applied to f of v, f of w, I get, uh, so v minus vi minus wi times, so uh, d over, uh, df over dj at point v, times f of w, uh, 
minus df over dj at point w times f of v and exactly the same but exchanging i and j. Once again, I hope that the notation is understandable. By df over dj, I mean the derivative of f respect to the variable number j, okay? And this I can rewrite as f of v times f of w times, uh, so vi minus wi df over dj of v divided by, so let's call it djf, like this, divided by f of v minus the same at point w, like this. And I subtract the same term, but exchanging i and j. And I get exactly this quantity here. So what is inside the bracket here, I will now systematically denote it by q, i, j, f of v and w. Sorry for the, this notation, which is a little complicated. But the point is, if I apply now this to this, since f of v times f of w is equal to something which depends only on those two quantities, we know that this quantity has to be zero. We know now that this quantity is zero, okay? So let me uh, project it here. So actually, provided that f does not cancel, I have just proven that starting from the entropy dissipation of Boltzmann, this quantity here is equal to zero. Okay? So it's quite coherent with the hypothesis, let's say that the logarithm of f is, uh, has some irregularity since basically I suppose that f does not cancel. Okay. Uh, now let's look at this identity. Uh, this is just the cross product between V minus W and gradient F over F of V minus gradient F over F of W, okay? Those are just the components of the cross product. And so to say that this quantity is equal to zero exactly amounts to say that the gradient F of F of V minus the same quantity at point W is parallel to V minus W for all V and W. And this is one way to, uh, as we will see, this is one way to characterize the Maxwellian functions of V. That is only the Maxwellian functions of V satisfy this inequality, this, sorry, this uh, constraint. Actually, you can check already that if F is a Maxwellian, then gradient f over f is an affine function of v, and so if you remove, uh, uh, if you take the, this function at point v and at point w, and you subtract it, you eliminate the constant term, and you get something which is linear, and it gives you exactly v minus w, okay? So this is clearly satisfied by Maxwellians, and the point is to show that it characterizes Maxwellians. But, before going further and keeping on uh, writing down the proof of Boltzmann, let's just have a look at the entropy dissipation of Landau. So this I also wrote down at the end of last lecture. And if you remember, so this is an integral over now two variables. So here it's written in R2, but actually it's true for any dimension. And inside you have uh, the product of f at point v and w, you have this function psi which is uh, 
the cross-section. So here it's called Psi. So in the theorem here, if you want to show the second part, you have to suppose that Psi is strictly positive. And if now you say, let's try to prove the, uh, uh, the, the, the proposition in the case of the Landau equation, then this means exactly that for all V and W, this quantity here is equal to zero. But now this is a quadratic form applied to the same vector, okay? And this quadratic uh, uh, form is represented by a matrix which is semi-definite positive. So this exactly means that this quantity here has to be in the kernel of this matrix here. But this matrix is a projector onto the orthogonal space to V minus W. So this exactly, this exactly means that this quantity has to be parallel to V minus W. So actually, if you start from the Landau equation, you end up immediately at the same level here. And as you can see, the proof of this part of the proposition is just a consequence of the proof of the previous proposition because there is an intermediate step at which you sort of transform the, uh, uh, the computation on the Boltzmann kernel to, in the computation for the Landau kernel. Okay. So from now on, we will start from here and we will prove at the same time both parts of the proposition. Okay. So let me first describe to you the proof due to Boltzmann. Um, so, uh, as I said, basically you take as many derivatives as possible. So at the end you need to know, for example, that log f is maybe c2 or c3. We already took one at this point when we use this uh, differential operator, and now we will take uh, two more of them. So, what we know is now that this quantity, this equality holds, okay, for all uh, uh, different indices i and j. So let's try to take derivatives, for example, with respect to the quantity vi here. So, let's do it. I, I take the derivative with respect to vi of this, and so I get exactly the term which is here, which you can recognize at this level, okay? Then, inside this term, you have a dependence with respect to v, so when you, you take the derivative with respect to vi, you will end up with vi minus wi, which comes out from here, and here, this term does not depend on v, so you just take the derivative with respect to vi of this one, and gives you exactly the second derivative with respect to i and j of log f. And this is the derivative with respect to j of log f. So you take one more derivative with respect to vi. Okay, so that's for this left-hand side. And now let's look at the right-hand side. So in the right-hand side, it's easier because this term does not depend on vi. Okay, i is different from j. And so you just have to, to take the derivative of this one. So you end up with vj minus wj, which is not changed, and here you take one more derivative with respect to the ith variable of log f, so you end up with this, okay? So when you did that, somehow you destroyed the symmetry between i and j, because you took a derivative with respect to vi, okay? So the natural thing to do then is to take a derivative with respect to j to re-establish the symmetry, okay? So let's first start to do it with uh, respect to wj. So you take the derivative respect to wj of this quantity here. This term does not depend on w, so it disappears. In this term, you have dj of log f of w. You take the derivative respect to wj, you get minus the djj log f of w. Then this one does not depend on wj, so it cancels. And in this one, the only dependence is through this wj here, which gives you minus dii log f of v. But what you end up with is this equation here, which gives you a link between the second derivatives of log f at point w and point v. 
And this is true for any V, W, I, and J. So you have a function of W which is equal to a function of V, so both are constants. So it already gives you that the second derivative respect to the same index of log F are constants. Moreover, those constants are identical for different i and j, okay? So you have already one part of the Haitian matrix of log f, and this tells you that the diagonal part of the Haitian matrix of log f is made out of constants which are identical on all the diagonal, okay? Let's now come back to the equation here and use a uh, a and take a derivative respect to wi. So if you do that, this term cancels. This one becomes minus dij of log f of w. Uh, in this one, only this term has a contribution and it's minus dij log f of v. And in this one, there is no wi, so it cancels. So you end up just with this. And here, once again, you, have, you get uh, a link between the second derivatives of log f, but this time, those are the second derivatives which are taken with respect to different indices i and j, okay? So this gives you the fact that uh, first, uh, this is a function of W, this is a function of V, so both are constants. And moreover, now you have a minus here and a minus here. So when you add the two constant, it should be zero, so the constant has to be zero. So this exactly tells you that the non-diagonal part of the Asian matrix of log F is made of zeros. So at the end of the day, what you have proven is that the Asian matrix of log F is just a constant times the identity. And you agree with me that this is exactly the same as saying as log f is a polynomial like this, and so f is a Maxwellian. And this gives you, yeah. Uh, so nothing at this point, of course. I, I, actually, I didn't say that c is positive yet. <laughs> but of course, the minus <laughs> gives a hint. <laughs> So you're right. I mean, uh, with this proof here, you, you end up with all possible Maxwellians, also the ones which are increasing very fast. So then the whole point is that if you suppose that log f, uh, let's say, is a C2, you have to add some kind of uh, hypothesis like, uh, for example, uh, uh, log f is this C2 unbounded, but you, you could think of many, many uh, kind of... Uh, Bounded above, I mean. Yes, for example, so, so you have many different kind of hypotheses which helps you to, to remove the, the possibility of having badly uh, shaped Maxwellians. So as you can see, basically, uh, Boltzmann worked by taking successive derivatives of the of the initial uh, condition on F. And so uh, his proof is a priori valid, provided that, let's say, log F is C2, you have to add uh, uh, an, an assumption which tells you that you can uh, uh, get only positive C here, and then uh, it looks like it's not uh, really uh, sufficient for, let's say, modern analysis in which you, you, you hope that in if you look at the solution of the Boltzmann equation, you hope that f has a certain irregularity, but asking for c2 is really a lot. Uh, so there is another way of seeing all of this, which consists in saying that all of this was done in the sense of distributions. And if you look at this, then you can see that basically, you only need that log f is somehow locally integrable, and that's it. And you can do it exactly with the same computation, but doing it in the sense of distribution, and you end up with a proof, which is a proof of Boltzmann, which is actually a sort of uh, modern proof, I would say. However, uh, let me take two minutes to uh, explain the, what is the goal now. 
The goal, if you remember all what we did on uh, entropy method, is at the end to get an entropy entropy dissipation estimate. So a link between D of F and H of F, which here is integral of F log F. So in some sense, when you wish for, uh, when you wish to prove uh, uh, an inequality, it's rather a good idea to start to check what is the case of equality in the inequality, and sometimes it helps you a little to, to, to try to prove the, when you try to prove the inequality. And uh, so if you have a proof of the case of equality, which is exactly what we are doing now, which is very robust, let's say by small changes in the, in the equality here, then you have a hope that you can transfer it in, a, in, in an inequality at the end. If the proof is not robust, then most probably you will not be able to transform it in a proof of the inequality at the end. And what is not robust in analysis in general is taking derivatives, okay? Basically, it's robust only if you are in an analytic uh, setting. If not, it's not a very good idea. So the whole point is to abandon the proof of Boltzmann and to try to find a proof which is more robust. So more robust means you have to uh, sort of uh, throw away uh, derivatives and instead take integrals, okay, which is a rather a natural notion in analysis, I would say. Uh, so it's what we'll be doing now, basically. <laughs> Uh, let me, be, before I, I, I show you how this can be done, let me conclude uh, on this uh, proposition here by saying that uh, basically uh, we have now the, the, the strict entropy structure because we have the following, uh, let's say, graph of implications, uh, what we just proved is that uh, the Boltzmann of F is equal to zero, implies in fact that the entropy dissipation of Lando is equal to zero, and this implies in turn that, let's do it like this, this implies in turn that F is a Maxwellian. This is just what we did in this proof. Uh, but we already saw uh, that F is a Maxwellian is, uh, let's say, implying that the uh, Boltzmann kernel and Lando kernel are equal to zero. These were the remarks that we made in the previous uh, talk. So we know that Uh, if you look at the, the operator of Boltzmann and Lando, we already have the two implications which are here. Okay? It was easy. If you remember, it consisted just in putting the Maxwellian in the kernels and checking that you get zero at the end. And moreover, if now you come back to the way the dissipation of entropies were uh, computed, you can see here that the entropy dissipation is the integral of the kernel times something. So it's obvious that you have a, an, an implication between those two things. And also, the same holds for Lando, that is the dissipation of Lando is obtained by taking the kernel and integrating it against something. So you have something like this. So I hope it's not, uh, <laughs> it's still uh, understandable in this way. We have made the totality of the circuit which shows that we have an entropy structure which is strict, except showing that the entropy itself is the minimum of the possible entropies. So for this, let me, re let me uh, write down again what is the entropy for both Boltzmann and Lando equation. 
it is the integral of f log f. And now, if you take f, which has mass, momentum, and energy, which are given, and remember that those quantities are conserved in the flow of the Boltzmann and the Landau equation, it's what we saw last time. If you take now the infimum of h when those quantities are given, so you suppose that you have mass, momentum, and energy which are given, and you take the infimum, it's clear that the Euler-Lagrange uh, equation related to that is just that the derivative of this with respect to f, that is log f plus 1, is equal to, thanks to uh, the Lagrange multiplier's theory, a constant times 1 plus another constant times v plus another constant times v squared over 2. So let's call it a prime plus b dot v minus c v square or v square over 2 and uh, up to changing a prime in uh, a prime minus 1 which becomes a we get again that f is a Maxwellian. Okay? So if f is satisfying the infimum of the entropy provided that the uh, conserved quantity are given, we get again the Maxwellian, which is the very last part of the proof of uh, the strict entropy structure for both Boltzmann and Landau equations. Okay? So now in order to introduce the very last part of the lectures, which is in some sense the most modern part because all what I showed uh, up to now uh, has been known for a long time. Uh, the point is to find a robust proof of this part here, and more, more precisely, because I'm speaking strictly of the Landau equation now, of the fact that the entropy dissipation of Landau leads to F equal to Maxwellian, we now need a robust, a robust proof which hopefully will give you an inequality at the end. So let's try to do that. So if you remember the starting point when you look at the Landau uh, entropy dissipation is that the quantity which is here and that we called Q i j f of v and w is equal to zero for all i j v and w. It's what is written actually here. So we have to know that this, we know that this quantity is equal to zero, and we want to show that f is a Maxwellian out of this. What we did previously is uh, consisted in taking derivatives with respect to various quantities in this quantity. Okay? So we took basically two derivatives and it worked. Now we don't want derivatives anymore because we want something robust. So the first thing to do is to take this, to take this quantity here, which is uh, uh, rather beautiful because it's completely symmetric and to actually couple together the terms which depend only on V so it gives this part here the terms in which you only have W which gives you this part here and the terms which are mixed so you have part with W and V and the same uh, with uh, uh, V and W and you put them in different places okay but it's exactly the same so I'm just saying that this quantity is equal to zero. And the point is that there is actually a transform which starts from Q equal this and which gives you the gradient of log F of V in terms of this quantity. So the point is you, you know Q in terms of this quantity and you want to do exactly the reverse. You want to write this quantity in terms of Q. So actually the formula is written here. So this is a formula which sort of inverts the relation that you have above. So I will try now in 15 minutes to explain to you <laughs> how we get this. As you will see it's not very difficult once 
you know what to do. So, we start from here. Q is equal to this. So the first thing I do is that I multiply this Q, Qij, by 1, and I take the integral with respect to W only. So when I do this, uh, this part just becomes the same. So let me write it like, uh, like this. Okay, so this is for this part here, and uh, and uh, uh, sorry, I multiply here by f of w. So here I will get the integral of f of w dw. Okay, so this comes from the first the first term here. Then I look at the term which is here. I multiply by f of w and I integrate over w. Since this is uh, a derivative, dgf, it gives you zero. Okay, so this one disappears. Uh, of course, it's the same for, 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 for this one because you integrate against f of w, so you just get the integral of dif and it gives you zero. Then let's look at this one. This one gives you minus dif over f of v times the integral of f of w, wi, dw. Okay? And this one gives you the same, but with the plus sign. and you change i in j. And finally, for this one, remember that you multiply by f of w and you integrate. So, for example, here it will give you an, integrate, an, integra an integral sorry, of w times djf. You do the integration by parts and you will get that you have djwi times f and djwi is zero. So you get so, so this one gives you zero, and of course it's the same for it, it's the same here because i and j can be exchanged. Okay, so the last one does not give you any contribution. So I end up exactly with the formula which is written here. Okay, and as you can see, this is a formula which links actually dif over f, djf over f, and this complicated quantity here, uh, which is sort of a component of V cross product with gradient F over F. Okay. So next step, and this time I take my paper because uh, I don't want to make any mistakes at this point. This time I do the same, but using now uh, as a multiplicator not only f of w, but f of w times wi, wi being the i component of w. So when I do that, I try, to, I try to do the same. So this term still gives me this. Okay, so this one is easy. Now next one, I multiply by wi, I integrate, and by f of w, I integrate, and I get dj of wi is equal to zero, so this one is zero. But next one, 
corresponds to multiplying by wi f of w, so the f of w cancel, and I get wi di f, which after integration by part will give me exactly minus integral of f. So here I will get minus di f over f, sorry, minus d j DIF over F, sorry, integral of F of W DW. Okay. It's the one which is coming from this term here. Okay. So next one, I multiply by W and by uh, F of W, so I get, uh, actually it's better to put it here, so I get minus djf over f of v times the integral of f of w, wi square, dw. For this one, I multiply by wi f of w, so I will get, I will change a little z. Okay. So this one, I put, I put it here, right? It's really better to do it this way. Okay, I've transferred it here. So sorry, I remove it. And I will write the term coming out uh, of uh, here at this level here. So it will give plus DIF over F of V integral of f of w, w i, w j, d w. Uh, and then one has to treat the last term here. So uh, in this one, I multiply by w i f, and so I yeah, will get here w i to the square, but once I integrate by part with respect to the j derivative, it gives you zero. So this one disappears. And the last one corresponds to multiplying by wi here. I, take the, I do the integration by part, so I will get plus wjf. Times, uh, times nothing. Just like this. And that's it. So let me check. I really did the computation and just <laughs> I didn't look at my notes. So let me check that it's okay. Um, so V I D V F J. Minus V G F. Minus Yeah, that's it. I'm very proud. So, <laughs> so now I do the last one, and the last one consists in doing exactly the same, but using now uh, wj instead of wi. So here, of course, you can do the same computation as previously, but you can also notice that i and j can be exchanged, and it helps you a little to write down the, the good formula. So let's do it this way. Um, so I will get now vi djf over f of v minus vj dif over f of v, like this, times the integral of f of w, wj dw. Then there is a term with dif over f, which is integral of f of w, wj square, so which corresponds actually in this one in the other line. Next one is plus dif over f of v times the integral of f of w, wj square, w, so this one corresponds to this one. 
story I wrote, I wrote two times the same. So it's, here it's the term in DJ, there is a minus and there is WIWJ here. And uh, for the final terms, it's quite easy. You get VI integral of F of W DW and minus integral of F of W WI DW. So basically, you take this one, you exchange I and J, and you change the signs, and you get it. Well, anyway, the whole point here is to get, actually, a system in which the unknowns are now indicated here, in brackets. So actually, it's better to, to use as a known minus EGF, so like this. So in the brackets, you have the unknown of a 3 times 3 system in which appear the quantity you want to compute, which is DIF over F, but also the same quantity for a different index, and this complicated quantity here, which is V cross product gradient F. So once you're here, you just have to solve. And to solve it, you just use Kramer's formula, once the determinant, okay? So now, if you look at the formula here, this consists just in writing Kramer's formula for this system, and you end up exactly with this, so, for example, you can check the determinant which is, uh, which is here, which is composed really on those columns here that you can see. So, F times 1, WI, WJ, WI, WI, WJ, WJ square, and the same here, and it's exactly what you will end up with in the system. The upper part is a little more complicated because you have to write down uh, those terms here, and also the terms which are here as a right-hand side for the system. So this is the part which appear in the column here because you're really computing the second unknown in the system. So the second column consists of those things, okay? So now you've done uh, what you needed to do, that is to transform, sort of invert this formula here. Now you have DIF over F in terms of the rest. And the case of equality that you wish now to, to show consists in supposing that all the QIJF, I mean the QIJF is equal to zero. So if you rewrite it now, if you take QIJF equal to zero, you end up with the formula here. And as you can see, here you have a determinant in which V does not appear, so this is a constant. And at this level, you have V which is appearing in the second column only, so that this is really an affine function of V. So you exactly ended up with the fact that the gradient F over F of V is an affine function of V, which is, of course, equivalent to the fact that F is a Maxwellian. One has to be a little careful. Here, actually, I proved that F is a Gaussian, to be precise. But if you do it carefully, you can get that F is a Maxwellian. Um, so, what is the interest of doing this with respect to the proof of Boltzmann? It is that, as you can see, I use no derivatives here, okay? This was done only by integrating. And so, hopefully, this is more robust. Actually, it is. It is really much more robust than the proof of Boltzmann. Um, I would like to end this uh, lecture by one small remark which is that uh, I, I did as the bad students, I did not check that the, what is under the, the division is not zero. So one has to be a little careful here, and one has to check that this quantity is not zero. Actually, this quantity can be seen as a grad determinant, but if you don't want to, to use that, you can just think of what it means. This determinant is zero exactly if those three columns are uh, sort of, uh, 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 let's say, uh, linearly dependent with respect to the measure f of w dw. So 
So this means this will be equal to zero exactly when F is concentrated on a hyperplane made of, uh, with an equation which relates to the uh, linear uh, dependency of the three columns here. So this is zero only if F is a direct mass on a hyperplane, to be clear. Okay? As soon as F is a function, let's say L1, this cannot be equal to zero. Uh, I think it's clear, I, I hope it's clear. <laughs> Not completely sure, but I hope it's clear. Uh, and so, uh, now this is enough for the proof of uh, the case of equality, but if you think then to a possible proof of an inequality, you will have to uh, estimate this determinant here from, from below. You will have to show that this is strictly positive, provided that you are in the right set of functions f. And what is the right set of functions f? But those functions which typically have a finite entropy. That is such that integral of f log f is bounded. And what integral of f log f bounded provides to you is exactly, uh, uh, let's say, a, a quantitative bound on the fact that f does not concentrate on, on sets of measure zero, like, for example, hyperplanes. So this is, this is controlled by the fact that f has an entropy which is bounded, which is given, if you wish. Okay, so that we are rather in a good shape from this point of view. I think maybe it's a good time to stop the, to stop the lecture and we'll see the consequences this afternoon. <laughs>